Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar tonight. I'm Joe Hinsley, Rector of St. George's Episcopal Church here in Fredericksburg, Virginia. We're glad to see our participants are joining, and I'm just going to give a few housekeeping announcements. So um, our webinar tonight, 300 Years of St. George's Parish, a unique microcosm of American history, will be presented by Craig Raines and Tripp Wiggins, who are members of our St. George's History Committee. And we are also joined by Stuart Henderson, Cindy Helton, and Melena Henderson, also of our, of our History Committee tonight. Just a little bit of, of how this webinar uh, Function. So for more information about our 300th anniversary, you can go to our website. Uh, tonight is offered uh, free as a free event. We appreciate any donations you might want to share in Thanksgiving uh, for our 300th anniversary. And I'll post a link to that in the chat as well. And there will be a recording of this discussion that we'll have posted. And that uh, if you register, we'll make sure that you uh, get that directly as well. So if you miss something, don't worry, you'll get a chance to go back and hear it again. So this is a webinar, which means that only the panelists will be visible, but we'd love to interact with our participants through the chat window and the Q&A window. So at, what you'll see is that you have two options. One is for chat, and that allows you to interact with the panelists or with other participants. Uh, if you wanna interact with, so you have to click on, on who you wanna interact with, whether it's, and you'll note it, it says to all panelists or it'll say to all panelists and participants. Um, if you want to ask a question, the Q and A window uh, is the best way to do that because that allows us to track, track it a little bit more easily. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little, uh, speech bubble that and it says Q and A underneath it, and you can click on that and submit your questions at any time. And so we'll be keeping track of those, and then when we get to a stopping point in the discussion, we'll make sure that those questions are addressed. So we hope that you can participate with us uh, through those means, even though we can't see you or hear you, we can read what you have to say in the chat or the Q and A window. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Cindy Helton to introduce our presenters tonight. And uh, as I have been saying uh, in other presentations that the History Committee has done recently, uh, as Rector of St. George's, I am so thankful and delighted uh, at the work that they have done helping to uh, research more and more of the story of our parish as we celebrate our 300th anniversary and as we seek to tell uh, a broader story, a more inclusive story of, of the history of, of this place and what God has done here, what God's been up to, what human beings have been up to, ways in which we, we can celebrate, ways in which we need to, to look, uh, look hard at our history and, and see how we can be better. So I will turn it, now, turn it over now to Cindy Helton. And unmute yourself, please, Cindy. Thank you, Pastor Cho. It's a tremendous privilege to be here and to work with this wonderful committee. Our hope is that God will take our efforts and use them for God's glory. Um, I'd like to introduce um, the presenters tonight. Uh, Craig Raines has been a member of St. George's Parish since he and his wife, Carol, retired to Lake of the Woods from Arkansas in 2002. He's a member of the parish's 300th anniversary history committee and was a St. George's delegate to the diocesan convention in 2019. He's been involved in the parish docent program, including writing the first docent manual and in training new docents. He holds an education for ministry program certificate from Swanee, the University of the South and for several years was a leader in the Episcopal Crusillo movement in Arkansas. 
He also is a member of the Historical Society of the Episcopal Church. After graduating from the University of Arkansas, he served two years as an army officer. He spent 40 years in advertising, public relations, and governmental affairs while co-partnering co co a regional advertising agency. He found time to be an adjunct professor uh, in advanced journalism at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock and taught communications at historically black Philanthrop Smith College there. His fourth great grandfather, James Craig, came to the Virginia colony from Scotland in the 1750s. After being ordained a church, uh, a church of England priest in London in 1758, he served in Cumberland Parish in Southside, Virginia for 35 years. A book about Reverend Craig's life, Patriot Parson, was published in 2017. I'm also happy to introduce our uh, colleague and partner, Trip Wiggins. Uh, Trip uh, and I started before we uh, had the history committee with the archives committee, along with Barbara Willis, our co my co-chair now, who could not be with us uh, this evening. And um, also with um, um, John Pierce, Ed Jones, Ben Hicks, and, uh, and that has been a, a long going effort, uh, ongoing effort. Uh, and Trip Wiggins was part of that uh, original archives group. This group started working for the, on the 300th celebration material in 2017. Trip is a retired Naval officer who, when not serving on the St. George's History Committee, is working at Dahlgren as a civil, civil servant, served as a past junior warden, a Boy Scout leader over uh, 50 years and going. Um, um, I think that should be 20 years, it's my typo. A member of the Fredericksburg Welch Society, teaches classes on genealogy in the Fredericksburg Regional Genealogical Society, or portrays an 18th century person in the Rappahannock Colonial Heritage Society, which he and his wife Myra helped found about 20 years ago. He's also a cradle Episcopalian who moved to Fredericksburg in 1991. On the history committee, he has expanded and updated the biographies of all the St. George's rectors. He has with the Central Rappahannock Heritage Center archived the St. George's materials. Uh, I know you're in for a special treat as you listen to Craig and Tripp tonight. I'd also like you to know that Melena Carrie Henderson is a member of this committee. She's been a member of St. George's since 2007. She served as an original member of the History Committee and the Race and Reconciliation Book Group. She completed her Bachelor of Arts degree with a major in journalism at the University of Detroit. She was awarded a Master of Fine Arts degree in creative writing from the Graduate School of the City uh, University of New York. In her career as an author, she won two first place awards in playwriting. The first was at the Playwriting Festival in Tulsa for the play, A Question of Color, and the second play titled The Eclipse, awarded by Stage Door Productions in Fredericksburg. In continuing her writing career at St. George's, she wrote and produced three children's biblical plays for the theater group, uh, the theater camp. And in 2017, she and her fellow parishioners, Jessica Atkinson and Shandell Perone, wrote and produced a three-part Black history program for St. George's. 
in 2018, the Friends of the Wilderness Battlefield Organization asked Milena to write and produce several one-act plays for depicting the depicting of the important events in Black history titled Untold Stories that we would be presented at several Fredericksburg churches. We're so happy that Milena is serving on the panel with us tonight. Her husband, Stuart Henderson, is a seasonal interpretive park ranger at the Fredericksburg Spotsylvania National Military Park. He arrived at the park in February 2005 as a volunteer and became an interpretive park ranger in May of 2007. He's also past president and co-founder of the 23rd Regiment United States Colored Troops, joining with other Civil War historians. He is an author with the emerging Civil War. He is now also a battlefield guide with Fredericksburg Tours. After attending Howard University, Stuart began a 35-year career in financial services where he served as area manager and senior vice president for retail banking at SunTrust Bank, recently merged with B uh, b and Bank as Truist Bank. He also completed programs with the American Institute of Banking and the Consumer Bankers Association Graduate School. Stuart retired from his banking career in 2005 to pursue an interest in American history with a special focus on the Civil War. Before coming to St. George's Church, Stuart was a member of St. Monica's Episcopal Church for 45 years while he lived in Washington, D.C. He served on the vestry for one year, served on the finance committee for several years, and was an acolyte from the time he was eight years old uh, to 16 years old. And uh, I'd also uh, like to mention that Milena uh, is a recently published author. Her book on Wings of Freedom, set in the year 1860, was published this past December. Thank you all again for being with us. And I turn um, the program over to Craig Rains. Thank you, Cindy. Let me see if I can uh, pull my screen up, but if I can, we'll be in good shape. You know, tonight we want to do something uh, and present St. George's in a different way. 300 years is pretty tough to combine all into one, two, or three or four presentations. We're gonna do a piece of it tonight. Uh, actually, we're gonna take a, uh, a look at St. George's and the history highlights in part one from 1714 to 1732. <clears throat> and uh, I will take that part and then Trip will follow up and pick it up at 1732 and bring us up to the Civil War. So let's begin with um, the parish and the namesake. Who is its namesake anyway? Uh, were we named for King George I? Well, <clears throat> King George I, I'll have to do a little water here. <clears throat> King George I ruled the British Empire, of course, and that included the American colonies uh, from 1714 until his death in 1729. So he was a, quote, supreme governor, as they called him back then, of the Church of England. And uh, that's when St. George's was established, was under King George I as an Anglican parish. The flag of England is this flag, and it is a St. George's cross. The red cross is known as the St. George's cross. It's been used ever since the Middle Ages. Uh, wasn't just for King George, but it did fly when he was the ruler. Remember this flag because you're going to see it again later on in the presentation when we talk about what happened after the American Revolution. 
just as in the United States today, England doesn't have any laws about what they can do, what people can do with their flag. For example, if they want to sit on it, they can sit on it. If they want to take a shower behind it, they can take a shower behind it. If they want to put it on a funny hat and wear it on Boxing Day, they can do that. If they want to wrap their children in it, they can do that. Or if they want to sleep under it, they can do that. Or do all sorts of strange things with their flags. But it wasn't King George. George I was not the namesake. So who is the namesake anyway? Was it George Washington? Well, we all know the story about George Washington, how people wanted to make him king when we won the American Revolutionary War. Uh, but George, of course, would have nothing to do with that. So he became President George Washington. And he, but he did, in fact, have a connection with St. George's Parish in Fredericksburg. In 1738, when George was six, he and his family moved to what we know as Ferry Farm across the Rappahannock River from Fredericksburg. About eight blocks southeast of the church is City Dock. And uh, that's where you can look across the river and see Ferry Farm, where George spent his childhood. And also this is where supposedly he threw the silver dollar across the Rappahannock, not the Potomac River. But we know that that's another fable too. So we're talking about fables here. But the family lived over across the river and that was Stafford County. And so that was another parish. So they were assigned to another parish. But it's in all probability, the Washington family probably took the ferry across over there, over here to City Dock and uh, walked up to church on Sundays because it was so close and convenient. George inherited Ferry Farm when his father died, but he left home to become a surveyor when he was 21, and uh, his mother ran the farm for him. Then in uh, 1772, George came back and bought his mother a house in Fredericksburg, and she retired from farming and uh, did, did a beautiful job of, of her gardening there in Fredericksburg in her house. It was close, he bought it for her because it was close to where his sister Betty Lewis lived in Kenmore. And also she could walk from there down to St. George's to go to church. And there are, are people who have written that she was sometimes the first one in the church for the services. Well, we don't know that George, when he was growing up, attended. St. George's. We don't know whether he did, whether he studied or not under one of our rectors, Reverend Marie, we think he did. We don't know whether he actually learned surveying from one of our church members, George Hume, who was the regional surveyor, but we assume that that's probably true. But no, with all of this, we know that the parish was not named for him. So who is its namesake anyway? Well, Maybe it's named for a real person. Maybe it's named after a mythical person. Maybe it's named after George the Dragon Slayer. Well, there's several of those George the Dragon Slayers throughout history. But we'll take one, for example, tonight. Uh, since the original St. George's Church was established out in Germana by uh, Alexander Spotswood, uh, for German immigrants that he brought over to America to work in his furnaces. He may have suggested naming it after a St. George who was from Germany and was a dragon slayer. Maybe he did that to make his immigrant workers feel at home. So George the dragon slayer lived in, the, in a valley in a town that I can't pronounce, but it's Ebringer. Uh, in the southeast western port part of Germany. Uh, the little village, beautiful village today, but at the time it was full of pagans and they were fearful, as the tale goes, of a fiery uh, dragon that lived in a cave up in the mountain. And it's to the point where even people, they would sacrifice people to 
the dragon pit on occasion. Well, George found out one time that he had secretly converted to Christianity. And so he uh, was one of a few in the area. But he learned one day that there was a young daughter of the local prince that had been selected as the sacrifice to the fiery dragon. So young George decided that he would make sure that that wouldn't happen. So trusting in his God, he fought the, the dragon and killed him and saved the damsel. Now that same story is told about other St. George's everywhere. But uh, in this particular instance, the town was so grateful that uh, St. George uh, killed the dragon that they celebrated by putting crosses on their gables of their houses. And to this day, when you go to that town in Germany, there are still some houses standing of the crosses, the gables. Well, our St. George, here he is. He stands ready over in the corner of the chancel. He's on a banner that's carried in processions on special days. Notice the, Saint, the red St. George's cross on his shield. There's the, lion, there's the uh, dragon. And uh, just like the medieval flag, he is protecting himself from the dragon with the, the flag that was flying during the time of King George the first day. Maybe he's our main, namesake for today, and he may not be true. But with the Germanic beginnings of our, our parish and our church out in Germana, we'll, we'll play like it anyway. Well, let's back up some of our history and take a look at the Church of England in the colony of Virginia. It arrived with the first English ship in Jamestown in 1607, and it was form formally established as the official church of the colony by the House of Burgesses in 1619. The first Jamestown church, which is no longer standing, uh, was replaced by this one, and the remains of this one that was begun in 1639 still stands today. In Virginia, the Church of England ruled, not only in the religion, but also in, in uh, politics. Uh, in Virginia, there was a decree from London, and the Bishop of London was the one that ruled on all of the Anglican parishes in Virginia. There was a decree from London that basically combined the goals of church and state. It set up a system of parishes run by vestries, which was odd because in England, everything was run out of the, the bishop and uh, they didn't have parishes and they didn't have vestries. The second, the third thing that was really important was that everybody who lived in Virginia had to join a local parish, even if they were a dissenter, if they were a Presbyterian or a Baptist or a Congregationalist, it didn't matter. They still had to become a member of the Anglican church parish. And it was required of everybody to pay the parish levies. Vestry would get together, determine what the budget was going to be for the year and issue, send out the bills and everybody had to pay whether uh, you were an active Anglican or not. And then it required everyone to attend, attend church services. Now, the Virginia General Assembly, in their piety, drew up what they called acts of religious tolerance. Well, take a look at some of the acts of religious tolerance. In 1610, there was a penalty for working on Sunday, and it was whipping, being whipped. There was a penalty for protesting the doctrine of the Trinity or Christian religion. The penalty was death. In 1617, the penalty for not going to church Sundays and holidays was to lie neck and heels that night. Now, it's an odd phrase, lie neck and heels, but I'll just say that what they would do is tie a rope around your neck, lay you down, and then bend you backwards and tie the other end of the rope 
to your ankles. And they let you sleep that way at night for missing Sundays or holidays. Well, they got a little more lenient by uh, 1642. So the penalty then for missing one Sunday service was just a fine of one pound of tobacco. And if missing a whole month of services, you are fined 50 pounds of tobacco. And back in those days, tobacco was the uh, coin of the realm. That's what people used to buy and sell things because there weren't very many uh, English pounds floating around. Here is the gentleman that uh, we will give credit for what he did out at uh, Germana. Lieutenant Governor Alexander Spotswood. Now, uh, the thing about the, the way that England ran the colonies is that they would appoint a governor and the governor was somebody who was a buddy of the king and he never set foot in Virginia. And instead they would appoint someone here in Virginia to be the Lieutenant governor. And he would actually uh, be the chief executive for the colony. Well, Lieutenant Governor Alexander Spotswood, he got involved in Williamsburg, was uh, very active down there as the Lieutenant governor. Uh, he did all sorts of things, including being the architect for the Bruton Parish Church in Williamsburg in 1610, he designed it. Then he came up here, he bought thousands of acres of land out here in uh, Orange County and Spotsylvania County. And uh, he founded the Germanic colonies here on the Rapidan River in 1714 and a second one in 1717. And then he's the one who had the House of Burgesses established St. George's Parish, our parish, in 1720. And if you haven't been to Old Williamsburg, here is a picture of the, the, Burge, the, the Bruton Parish House that uh, Governor Spotswood designed. It's a pretty nice legacy for him. St. George's Parish, number one, we're not there yet. The German Reformed Church at, at Germana. Uh, I mentioned two St. George's and uh, the first one was definitely not Anglican. The House of Burgesses set it up for Governor Spotswood as a German Reformed Church and uh, the new parish was cut out of one that was existing at the time. It was a St. Mark's Parish. And they drew a circle around this little area, which was his little town of Germana. They drew a five mile circle all the way around it. And they said, everybody that lives inside that circle will not have to pay taxes to the Anglican church. And that the only people living there were the Germans that Governor Spotswood brought over. So this is the site that's been, they think, uh, has been redrawn. You can tell this bottom line, Route 3, goes to Fredericksburg below and goes to Culpeper up here. Over here on the left, the mill site, that is uh, the location of the, um, of the museum and uh, the conference center that they have out there. And then the whole area around it is Germana Community College. Across the way, this little funny looking thing is a blockhouse, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Now, the new parish was cut out of uh, St. Mark's and it, the people that came in, he lured them over. Well, he promised them he'd pay them some money uh, from Germany. And so they showed up and formed the first St. George's Church. It was the first permanent German reformed church in America. They met in the central blockhouse and they had about 42 members at the beginning. Now here's that funny shaped building in the middle of this. This is the blockhouse and um, uh, it was used for church services and it was also used for town meetings and it was used for other things. Uh, and it just, to, uh, it was a place where they would all go if the, 
if they needed to defend from the Indians and Native Americans. Uh, in 1715, a visiting off, uh, British officer came by and noticed the blockhouse. He thought it was really strange. But he wrote back, he said, talking about the Germans who were living there, they make use of this blockhouse for divine service. They go to prayers constantly once a day. They have two sermons on Sunday. We went to hear them perform their uh, service, which was done in their own language, which we did not understand. But they seemed very devout and sang the Psalms very well. That was British officer John Fontaine writing in 1715. Two years later, a second colony arrived at Germana. This time they were evangelical Lutherans. Now, there were about 20 families or about 80 people that showed up from England. They had gotten on the ship and he cast off and the ship's captain came around to collect their fees. And so, landed over here, paid for their cost of transportation over. And uh, in exchange, they were going to become basically indentured servants for him. Um, they worshipped in the blockhouse, but they didn't worship with the Reformed Church. So the two groups decided they needed to build a separate church. So they went back to Europe and tried to get money to do that. Here's Westminster Cathedral on the left. They went to, to the Church of England. And over here on the right is St. Martin's Lutheran Church in Baden, Germany. And that's the same general area where our St. George uh, and his dragon lived. They also requested from the Anglicans, the Anglican Society for the Promulgation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. That's a long word, long title for a committee, uh, but they got turned down by the Church of England because the Church of England's rule was that they would only make grants in colonies where the Anglican Church was not entrenched. And you know it was well entrenched here in the colony of Virginia. However, it did promise to send 25 copies of the Church of England's Book of Common Prayer printed in German. Well, in 1719, the first colony decided they had had all of Lieutenant Governor Spotswood that they wanted. So they moved into Hanover Parish, which is now Fauquier County, across the Rappahannock River, and they established Germantown. Reverend Hager, who had been their minister with them in Germana, uh, went with them to oversee a new German Reformed church there. There was no act passed by the House of Burgesses to establish a new parish, which meant they had moved out of that circle of tax-free uh, over into Hanover Parish. So they paid their tithes to the Hanover uh, Anglican Parish, as well as the tithes to their own church. And they never did conform to the Church of England. Now, the interesting thing about these Germans that moved over there is that they divided up their land. They bought their land and they divided it equally among all of the families. Uh, and you can see this map was shown and you could tell where everybody's property was. It was all the same size and they were uh, quite a community. And today there's still some uh, people by that name, those names that live over there and that live in Spotsylvania, Fredericksburg, Orange, uh, Madison, and Culpeper, for example. This area right here where they lived uh, is today is inside the Commonwealth's Crockett Park um, in Fauquier County. Well, finally, we get to St. George's Parish, our parish. Lieutenant Governor Spotswood had the House of Burgesses set up a new county, an Anglican parish to include Germana. Um, and it was um, 
to replace the original parish and county boundaries with an act of the House of Burgesses effective in May of 1721. The new county parish line ran from Snow Creek on the east to a line down to the North Anna River and then up the river as far as convenient, which is interesting to me. And then from there to a line to be run over the high mountains, which is um, uh, the Blue, Mount Blue Ridge Mountains, uh, as far as they wanted to go, and then back down to the headwaters of the Rappahannock River. Governor Spotswood plans at that point to build a new place of worship for the Anglicans at Germana. He liked it being convenient to his home. Well, here is Spotsylvania County and St. George's Parish in 1720. This is the state of Virginia, of course. The purple is Spotsylvania County and St. George's Parish. It includes nine counties of today's Virginia. Right here is Fredericksburg. It was not close to anything for there. And here was, out here, was where Governor Spotswood lived. And then all of this other area was out, out there was part of the uh, parish. Well, after he got all of that set up, then the second group of Germans decided they were going to leave. They completed their indenture and they left for what is now Madison County. They moved up river and uh, they built a log structure known as the German chapel. And um, they established the Hebron Lutheran Church and people kind of nicknamed it the old Deutsch Church, Deutsch being uh, meaning German, not Dutch, Holland. Uh, so they ended up at one point with, um, uh, they grew so much that they had 300 members. They established their own Lutheran congregation and they named it Hebron Church. The present church building that they have was constructed in 1743 and is the oldest Lutheran church building in continuous use that was actually originally built by the Lutherans and has always been operated by the Lutherans in the United States. And I must say congratulations to the Hebrew Lutheran Church. They celebrated their 300th anniversary in 2017. With the Germans gone, Governor Spotswood decided it was time to build a new Anglican church at Germana rather than have the parish meet in the blockhouse. Since it was a law to attend church service on Sunday, the people of Fredericksburg, where a majority of the people of the parish lived, continued to ask the governor to please build a church closer to Fredericksburg. And he was in no hurry. He was busy doing things in, in Williamsburg. And, and uh, but, you know, there was a law where you had to have take care of the uh, board for the minister. Well, we know that in 1729, although St. George's has been built, had been okayed by the House of Burgesses in 1720, they still didn't have a place for the rector to live. So Reverend Kenner, who was our second rector, received a, an extra 4,500 pounds of tobacco each year to pay for his board while he still lived out of Germana. Now, they passed a law, the House of Burgess has passed a law that every parish had to provide a glebe. And if you were in our Sunday morning session, you saw more about the glebe. This is what a glebe looked like. Uh, they had to buy a minimum of 100 acres and build a house on it, a glebe mansion, uh, build a, an outdoor kitchen, build barns and so forth, and raise crops. And this was all for the benefit of the rector, which was a pretty nice deal. He lived there and got the profits off of the farm 100 acres as long as he was the uh, the minister in charge, the priest at that glebe. So our Fredericksburg vestry men got together and if they had had Google, this is what they would have looked like. They decided that they would build their glebe to be to coincide with uh, 
what the House of Burgess has declared. So up here in the upper left-hand corner where it says Germana, Germana Community College, that's where Governor Spotswood lived. They went all the way down here past Thornton over here to Guinea Station in that area around at the Poe River. That's uh, 31 miles, which is a long trek uh, in the 1700s. And they bought 544 acres of land uh, that they would make into a glebe for the rector of the church that was being built all the way out here at Germana. Well, Spotswood's refusal to listen to the parishioners to build the church closer to Fredericksburg was going to have dire consequences. In 1742, 1732, excuse me, this is where, this is a close up of the glebe where the glebe was. You can see Interstate today, Interstate uh, 95, and you can see Thornburg over here. And here is where the glebe was built. That we don't go matter. Shortly thereafter, a visitor went to Germana and he visited Governor Spotswood in the, and the governor was living in what he called the, uh, what, uh, the enchanted castle out in the middle of nowhere. This was the Western edge of civilization. And the gentleman wrote, he said that uh, a bow shot away from the governor's house had been a chapel, but some pious people had lately burned it down with the intent to get another closer to home. In fact, some parishioners from Fredericksburg had actually gone out when Governor Spotswood was not at home and had set fire to the church that he was building out there for them and burned it to the ground. Well, with the ashes smoldering, we'll end this segment of history about the historic St. George's Parish. It's now burned and crisp, and we will move on to the second section. And now I'd like to call on Trip Wiggins to continue our story for the next hundred years. Trip, who hopes very much that he printed off the correct script. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. One thing I want to add right at the beginning, uh, if you're new to the area, you've heard of Spotswood possibly, you've heard of Spotsylvania, obviously. Interesting thing about Spotsylvania County, it is the only county in Virginia that not only was named for a governor, Spotswood, Spotsylvania, gee, sort of sounds alike, but Governor Spotswood actually put it in. He got, he was the only one that submitted it to get it named after himself, and it worked. But he was, um, he was a mover and shaker of his day, big entrepreneur, always trying to get another big thing. Uh, the governor job was just kind of a stepping stone. He was, he was out to get much more personal uh, money out of this whole thing. Uh, and then that's why he had to go back to England to kind of work his, his good reputation back up so he could come back to Virginia and live like a king, which it didn't quite work out as quite as good as he could. So if you get a chance to read anything about him, he's a very fascinating character in our history. So we'll start with uh, the second half here. We leave off our creation of the parish of St. George's with its original church building located near Governor Spotswood's enchanted castle in smoldering ashes. Now we'll pick up the development of St. George's from that date in 1732. Because church attendance was mandatory, the parish established chapels of ease, which were similar or simple small buildings where parishioners could travel closer to home to hear morning prayer or on occasion, kind of rare occasions, the rector would come to preach or offer Holy Eucharist. Even homes could be used in this manner. The town of Fredericksburg was established by the House of Burgesses in 1728, eight years after St. George's was created, and planners drew up how the town would be built. And they set aside two lots for the church and its graveyard right there in the circle. There were other chapels and churches built in the parish, including the first Rappahannock Church, which was built outside the town limits we just saw, 
but today we'll focus on the three that eventually were built here on the site in, in uh, Fredericksburg. As Fredericksburg grew, the vestry decided to replace the first Rappahannock church, and we are not quite sure where it was located, with the new church built on the lot set aside for it by the city council or the city trustees, town trustees in those days. The vestry minutes detailed how the building should be built along with its sister parish, the Mattapanai Church to the south, south of the Po River. This is uh, how the artist conjecture looks at how we think it looks based on the details that are put into the uh, vestry minutes on, this is what we want you to build, a church this size. And it said it had to be uh, 60 feet by 24 feet with brick foundation, there would be 10 windows and the roof should overhang the sides by 12 inches. Whitewashing and painting instructions inside and out were included and there's more details in the vestry records. Then in 1734 came another alteration as the Virginia colony continued to grow. Its counties were changed. In 1734, Spotsylvania County was cut down and St. George's Parish cut down with it. Orange County was created, simply put. Orange County's line on their east was Spotsylvania's new western boundary, but Orange on the west ran all the way, legally I suppose you could say, to the Mississippi River. It's a big county, which covered what became all these modern states, pretty much the Northwest Territories. And it required an Orange County courthouse for the people in the western edges. It selected a courthouse used by the French decades earlier. Today, that Orange County, Virginia courthouse still stands where it was built. <laughs> Chicago's Jackson Park, is not, that's a good place for it. St. George's Parish, you'll have to ask Craig about the details of that. I'm not, I'm kind of fuzzy on all that. <laughs> uh, St. George's Parish was assigned to Spotsylvania and Orange County Parish or Orange County became St. Mark's Parish. But just prior to the division, St. George's learned of the proposed county split. Quickly, its vestry announced a new levy of tobacco, supposedly for the building of a glebe house. The vestry of St. Mark's discovered what had happened. Their taxes just went up. Um, and they pressed for the return of the levy given by those living in the new parish boundaries. Finally, higher authorities intervened and St. George's grudgingly gave over almost 12,000 pounds of levy tobacco to St. Mark's. It all worked out though. Around 1765, our rector, James Marie, whom you'll hear more about later, and Fielding Lewis, brother-in-law of George Washington, started a school for slave children named the Bray School. He was named for a British missionary who operated or opened a number of similar schools in America. Reverend Marie's son, also James Marie, took over as his, at his father's death of the school and our parish. The school struggled because slave owners were reluctant to allow their slaves to learn to read and write for fear they would forge passes for runaways, uh, which would not be good for them. Five years later, the school was closed, though additional attempts were made to teach slaves to read so they would be able to read the Bible and prepare for confirmation. And that went on for many years. St. George's was caught in cross loyalties in the American Revolution. It was part of the Church of England and its communicants were English subjects. Even St. George's rector had gone to England to be ordained in 1755. Following the war, organized religion fell out of favor. Church attendance was no longer mandatory. People stopped paying their tithes. It's no longer mandatory. Reverend Marie no longer was paid by the parish for his last three years of service in the, as rector, his income was only what individual church members might contribute directly to him. After the war, the church property was to become town property. This modern day photo shows the two lots allocated to St. George's in 1728. The church is built on the upper lot. The lower lot was to be the graveyard, but the ground proved to be so waterlogged and unsuitable, it was sold. The church decided to rebuild further away from the river and purchased what today is known as her camp park. Before action was taken on a new building, the parish established part of the new lot as a graveyard and began to bury its members there. When the war ended, plans for the building for the new church, the, uh, the town took over the lots. 
paperwork was sketchy back then uh, and the town just kind of took it. With that, the parish simply moved the headstones from the her camp location down to the current graveyard, but they left the bodies where we think they still repose today. The vestry quick, quickly made arrangements to become part of the newly formed Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States and distance itself from the Church of England, but kept ties. Although the flag of the Episcopal Church is not, was not created till 1940, it still honors its birth in the Church of England with the St. George's Red Cross and the cross in the Blue Union being the St. Andrew's Cross to remind us that our first American bishop after the war was consecrated in Scotland. The nine crosses that make up the St. Andrew's Cross are for the nine original colonies that created America. It wasn't 13 to start with. But the parish dwindled to about a dozen families. Slowly it began to rebuild. It struggled to find or keep rectors, and at one point had three rectors within an eight-year span. But during that time, the vestry and the members tried to rally. The Fredericksburg Academy for Boys was established, later the Female Charity School for Indian Girls, but both were funded primarily by St. George's members themselves and not the parish. Finally, in 1813, Edward McGuire was called to be our rector. He was only 20 years old. He was too young to administer communion or even be ordained a deacon until the following year when he turned 21. He went to London to be ordained and returned to stay as our rector for 45 years. He was so impressive in his work that Kennan College awarded him an honorary Doctor of Divinity degree. Under Reverend McGuire, the parish built its second building on the site at St. George or at George and Princess Anne Streets in 1815. This is a conjectural drawing of what it may have looked like. Unfortunately, we don't have any good drawings of it at all. Um, and here's a photograph of the Little Fork Church in Rixieville in Culpeper County. Its site was originally was one of the chapels of ease that Lieutenant Governor Spotswood established for Anglicans in St. George's Parish in 1731. And it's still happily in use today. I've been there, I've worshiped there, and it's a nice little church. McGuire started building a fire under the parish. Um, he was an, a great speaker. He could pull in all sorts of a crowd and the crowd stayed. That's the amazing thing. Attendance grew. Some Sundays he preached as many as 500 people. The Sunday schools grew so large that a new building was erected in 1823, now known as Faulkner Hall. It is our oldest building on the church grounds. By the 1840s, growth called for a still larger church to be built. There was much discussion as to what architecture would be chosen. The first design was Gothic Revival, formed with a bell tower at the front corner of the building. But in America, there was a trend towards Romanesque Revival form, which opened up the inside and made it lighter and brighter. Unfortunately, John Pierce has passed on. He could spike just to those two topics for two or three days, I think. <laughs> the latter won out, and it was completed in 1849. This is an early postcard of the the building. The new church, our present one, cost $19,000 to build, funded by loans from two banks and backed by vestry members. Like the building it replaced, funds were raised to pay for, pay, hmm, pay for it by an auction that was held on the day after the first service. Parishioners could bid on renting pews, and that rent would be applied to the bank loans. Before the day was over, the spirited bidding had topped the 19000 and the church was paid for. At the same time, the city council noted that St. George's Bell Tower was the tallest point in the town, and they voted to pay for clocks to be installed in it for the convenience of the town people. We actually had the town sundial back in the 1700s, but a clock is much nicer. It also appropriated $20, the city did, for annual maintenance. This arrangement continues today. We host the clock, but they pay for the maintenance. Um, although the pulley-style timepiece that was put in originally was replaced with an electric one, still it is a unique example of the joining of church and state for the common good. And if you're curious about the original pulley system clock, uh, that's on display next door in the Fredericksburg Museum. From the 1830s, there had been talk of secession in some states, but Virginia had indicated it was really against it. 
Lincoln's call for state militia to go to the Charleston to defend Fort Sumter, the people of Fredericksburg were again faced with the same decision as they had at the start of the American Revolution. Do they side with the larger government or do they side with their friends and family? Virginia reluctantly joined its Southern brothers when it seceded in April 61. It was definitely not the first to secede. Federal troops came down from Washington and occupied Fredericksburg a year later. Union soldiers attended services at Fredericksburg and were met with scorn from the women who attended. However, one Union colonel there filed a report that the rector, Reverend Alfred Randolph, had not included a prayer for the President of the United States in the morning service. However, he did note that the rector also did not pray for the president of the Confederacy. With that vision in our minds and the ruinous war looming, we end this, our segment of the first part of the history highlights of St. George's Parish. And I think we're gonna open it up for questions. Cindy, it's back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Craig and Trip, for that trip down uh, history, through history there um, at the early St. George's Church. Uh, one question came uh, in, which rectors lived at the Glebe? Um, I think the only rector that actually really lived out there was Marie for a while, the first Marie. And then by the time the second Marie was out there was about the time we sold the Glebe. And, and I'll let Craig go into more detail because he knows. Uh, the Reverend James Marie the, the first was the first and only rector to live in the parish. Uh, his wife died four years after they moved out there. And so rather than live out there, which was a pretty good horse ride into town, he ended up buying a, a plot, one of the blocks on Princess Anne Street and moved there, moved into town. And eventually the Glebe was broken up and part of it was sold into, uh, for the poor house. But uh, Reverend Marie ended up uh, serving out his time until his death, living on Princess Anne Street, about a block from the church. One other question, um, who led the services at the chapels of ease? Well, the parish uh, records, uh, the um, vestry minutes, uh, since they have to account for every shilling, every pence that's spent or every pound of tobacco, uh, it lists at the chapels, there's a local person may have been a vestry member, may not have been a vestry member, and he's listed in there as reader. So pretty much in the times when we didn't have a rector, you're gonna have a, a reader who's basically a lem, and he's going to do morning prayer. And that's gonna happen most of the time. And then when we do get a rector here, then the rector is going to be doing a circuit ride. He's not gonna be at every chapel every week. Uh, so he's gonna move around a little bit. So you're gonna have morning prayer more than most of the time. And then occasionally, when the minister shows up, then you'll have Eucharist. Yeah, interestingly, the um, the lay readers were paid in those days. I don't think we pay our lay readers who read for us on Sunday. But uh, the vestry sometimes would meet in those places of ease. Sometimes they would meet in people's houses. Sometimes they'd meet in taverns. So you never knew what uh, what the vestry was going to be up to. But uh, there were always in all of those different chapels of ease, there was always somebody there to read morning prayer. Um, another uh, participant would like to know, was the Episcopal Church ever known as the Church of Virginia? I do not think, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it never was. Uh, it, it was kicked out um, of, because it was Church of England and they had to immediately uh, join the new Protestant Episcopal Church that was being formed. So I think they went directly from uh, being a wayward lost soul right directly into the Protestant Episcopal Church. Are there any other questions?
Um, another participant has uh, indicated, I believe that the sign outside the church, which dates 1700, is a bit deceiving since there was no church on the property. Fredericksburg was established in 1728. Um, what happened? Um, and so, could you comment about that, please? Yes, uh, the sign says St. George's Episcopal Church. And St. George's Episcopal Church was established in 1720. It just wasn't at that particular location. So the sign is correct, but maybe people are misinterpreting it and thinking that uh, the church started at that particular corner of Princess Anne and George but it really started at Germana. Yeah, in those days, you're really looking at when was the parish established and the parish covered a huge area and it may have a few chapels in it. And then we finally built the church here in Fredericksburg to make it more centrally located to the population. Correct. And we had two churches being built at the same time in Fredericksburg. To Another question. Is the northernmost one. I'm sorry. Another question, what happened to the chapels of ease? Well, the, the only one that I can really know about, of course, is uh, the Little Fort, which looks a lot like our second church. Uh, the one that Tripp has actually been in. And I'm sure some of you all have, have gone over there to see it. It's a beautiful church, but that's not, that was not, built as a chapel of ease, but the chapels of ease were basically not very well constructed. And sometimes the chapels of ease were nothing more than someone's home. So uh, they came and went. There were no permanent, uh, they were not built as something that was supposed to be permanent. And I remember when, when Charles, when he did uh, his oral history a couple of years ago, he mentioned when Spotsylvania um, Christ Church was having financial problems, we actually helped them out by giving them a piece of property over in Spotsylvania that belonged to St. George's. I don't know exactly what was there, but he says by that time, it was just a few bricks in an area. It could have been a site of a chapel or I'm not sure why else we would own property over there. So, but they like, like Craig said, they were not built to say last centuries, and they, most of them just fell apart and disuse. Yes. Uh, does anyone know about Grace Church in Corbin? I don't. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, were there free blacks and enslaved people who attended St. George's during the first 100 years? The problem with our church records, um, I've been trying to find church records for our 25 years here. Um, pretty much all our parish records where you keep a list of baptisms, marriages, burials, communicants, confirmations, all that stuff, we were mandated by the Bishop of England to do that over here. But all our records, when the Civil War broke out, um, the vestry books somebody took home. So we still have most of the vestry books, not all of them. But the parish records, somebody took to Richmond for safekeeping. And when the Confederate Army, when the uh, Union Army was uh, attacking Richmond in 1865, and the war was just about over, uh, the Confederate Army torched Richmond to keep it from falling into Yan Yankee hands. And so our records don't exist. The, the earliest records we have for communicants, marriages, and all that um, only go back to about 1856, 58 time frame. Anything before that, the only thing we can look at is if there's a marriage certificate at a, uh, in a, or an announcement in a newspaper or in a courthouse record, um, there's nothing about births or communicants or even burials because state of Virginia did not mandate any of that until like uh, the 1850s and most counties didn't do it until far later. 
So it's it's a really sketchy time frame unless we can find really good diaries and stuff. And we've uh, not really found many of those. We do know that uh, during the Civil War, when the, they filed, um, I guess the ladies filed uh, a membership records with the diocese that in fact there were uh, black members of the church were actual members of the church were listed in two years in 1862 and 1863, I believe. Uh, but, can you, excuse me. But eventually uh, the, the, uh, the balcony was built or the gallery was built so that the uh, blacks could sit, the black uh, members who wanted to attend could sit up there and the slaves would sit up there and the free blacks also had to sit in the gallery. Okay. Can you expand um, on the burials at Hercamp Park? What percentage of current headstones came from the Hercamp location? Trip, do you know that? <laughs> I don't know which ones. Uh, I know currently in the cemetery, the oldest headstone we have is 1752, and it's just as you walk in. It's on the right. As you come in and you look to the right, it's right there. John Jones, a good Welshman who ran a tavern in town, and right. then his wife ran it after him. And we don't have any headstones in there older than that. Obviously, there were people dying before that. We had one journal I wrote of some visitor coming through town in the 1760s, I think it was, just for no other reason that it looked interesting to them. They recorded an inscription on a headstone from the 1730s. Uh, so I have that in my record someplace, but there is no headstone now. It was probably a, a wooden board uh, and those wooden boards don't last very long. Uh, when I give my cemetery tour in the fall, um, we always talk about headstones and why they're not around here anymore. Some, some reasons, because they just fell apart, our sandstone headstones are falling apart. There's some of them have tremendous damage and you can't even read anything on it. Some of them are made out of wood and somebody needed a board to mend a fence. So they just took the board and took it home. So you just never know what you're gonna find with this stuff. And what is we see out at Caledon right now, we have a, a bunch of headstones that they move from DC to a guy bought them as basically um, beach erosion on the river and now they know what they are and now they're trying to get them back to the cemetery it came from. So uh, Virginia is really kind of good on preservation, but they could be a lot better. Another question, the term bought has been used to describe the establishment of authority over swaths of land. Really, Governor Spotswood et al. simply a point, a, a, appropriated land, which was for hundreds of years prior to European arrival inhabited by indigenous tribes. Can you comment on that? Um, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, we came over here. It was not our land. It belonged to the, the natives. And they looked at land totally different than Europeans. Europeans buy and sell land and build things on it. And the natives said, we use the land, it's mother earth. We get valuable things from the land. We wanna give back to it. We don't wanna harm it because it gives us everything we need. So they, they just had a completely different outlook on it. So when Spotswood got his land, like a lot of the big landed gentry, they got it because they were friends of the king and the king just gave them thousands and thousands of acres that I guess he thought he owned and uh, that's, that's how it all got started. It's not the best way of, of building a new country, but uh, unfortunately that's our history. How is the German Reformed Church allowed to be established given the Anglican requirement? Well, it, if you'll notice, it, it, it was the guy that was running the colony. It, it was his idea to do it. And so he drew a fence around them and protected them from the Anglican fees and, uh, the, and the rules that they had to go to an Anglican church because they were 
his employees. They were living in his little community and he had the power uh, at the House of Burgesses to make sure that they would be protected and wouldn't have to go along with the rules that everybody else had to follow, uh, the dissenters and so forth, to uh, do follow the laws of the Anglican Church. Following his governorship, that's one of the reasons he had to go back to England to get his good name restored, because a lot of people started complaining what he did over here to grab thousands of acres and what he was doing to his German laborers. Now he he um, skirted laws that supposedly yes. he was in charge of enforcing, um, but whatever was good for him, it was good for him. And then he got out of office and um, it changed. That's true. There's another question about uh, the graveyard. So there are no bodies buried in the area we know as the church graveyard. I thought when her camp cemetery was closed, the bodies were relocated to the Confederate cemetery. The ones that they could find um, when they closed the her camp in, or they closed, yeah, that cemetery about 1844, the ones that they could find they moved over to the city cemetery next to the Confederate cemetery. It's all the, the same big cemetery. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, it's very confusing about where, whatever happened to the bodies. Because later on, uh, the there was a cemetery right behind it where the uh, Caldwell Banker is, because that was built as a Sears building. Uh, and it was on top of a cemetery too. And they just said, okay, um, here's what we're going to do. Move the headstones wherever you want, and you can't build a basement because we don't know what you're going to run into down there. <laughs> so that today is what's underneath the Caldwell building is a cemetery. And right behind it, there was another cemetery that was the Methodist Church. And the, those families also moved the headstones to wherever they wanted to, and they just left whoever was there there. Because when we did the renovation or when we built Faulkner Hall, um, or um, McGuire Hall back in 1959, um, when they actually did some digging for foundations to put in the building, all, all they found was a little bit of discolored dirt. There is, after 150 years in the ground, no embalming, no caskets for the most part, or if they would, they were wooden, and so there's nothing there. Uh, and they didn't, they didn't even find any buttons or anything. So um, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I might just comment about uh, when Faulkner Hall was built, there were uh, many um, letters to the editor, many newspaper stories about the protest to building Faulkner Hall, what we now call Faulkner Hall. It was then called the Sunday School Room. Uh, and th the protest were because people thought that grave, well, graves were there. And there was a great uh, hue and cry about erecting a building uh, over that area. And it's fun. When I first got here and I started playing with the history stuff, the first thing I did was make a good map of the, the cemetery. And I actually crawled underneath the crawl space of Faulkner Hall. And there's a couple of tombstones underneath there, but they're so big and they're laying down on its side. You could never move them, and you can't read any of the writing because it's on the, the face down side of it. But we believe, I mean, that's, there's they're still people buried under there. I think about uh, 2004 or 2005, when they were working on uh, Market Square and laying uh, the new pavers over at Market Square, that they uncovered four bodies that were there. Uh, thinking that probably they were buried from St. George's cemetery graveyard. Right. And so they were disinterred from over there and moved over to our graveyard. And um, the rector had a, a service over them uh, using the prayer book of the 1700s. And, um, and they were reburied in our cemetery. And I believe they thought one of them might have been a slave, that uh, he was buried apart from the others. But they all four were brought, oh, I think four, where they were all bought and buried together. Yeah, we have graveyard. a marker out there. If you walk over down, you can read it. It's a modern yeah. marker. 
one other question. I understand that Reverend McGuire's grave was moved when McGuire Hall was built. Can you comment on that? It was moved a little bit, but it was a big iron coffin. It was very easy. They could just pick it up. They didn't open it. They just moved it a few feet because it was going to be in the footprint of McGuire Hall. So they moved it and um, put it back in the ground. So it was that was the that was the only grave that they actually found with a real casket in it. Um, there's a question about the builders of um, St. George's, our current building. Do we uh, know who the builders were of that uh, of our current St. George's building built in 1849? We know who the architects were. John Pierce searched for that for years. <laughs> and uh, I think it was found just before he died. But uh, I have not seen anything about individuals who built, who had any hand in building anything. Yeah, I've never seen any sort of a construction crew list, whether they were free, whether they were slave. Um, it was probably a mix of both, but we'll just never know, I don't think. We don't have, the, the vestry minutes don't record anything about that. We, we do know that, um, that uh, we do know that there were names under the steps uh, of, the, of our current St. George's building of some of the artisans, a couple of them anyway. And we know that the architects from Maryland, from Baltimore brought uh, artisans with them to work in our church. I don't know the names. Um, I, I think we have them written down. I, I don't know the names, but they were discovered uh, under the steps. Um, uh, we also found human remains. Um, uh, Earl, uh, another writer says, we also found human remains under Princess Anne Street when we installed the sprinkler system during the nave renovation. Earl Bothman writes about that. Yeah, I, I wish Barbara was, was able to attend tonight because if you talk to her about finding bodies around Fredericksburg, it's like, all you got to do is put a shovel in the ground and you're going to find one in the middle of any street, in the middle of anybody's yard. They're everywhere. Street sizes have changed. Everything has changed over the years. So you just, you wouldn't even be surprised anymore. George Street next door to the church was actually a part of the graveyard. And the front of St. George's was also part of the graveyard in Princess Anne Street. But the one person we do know that is not buried there, although <laughs> every once in a while it's on find a grave and I have to send a person a note, is Fielding Lewis. A lot of people right. walk into the narthex and they see that little pewter cross in the floor in the narthex and they go, that's where Fielding Lewis is buried. And actually underneath that is the boiler. Um, and Fielding Lewis is buried about a hundred miles away on his son's property. Uh, we know that because right after he died, his kids were writing letters back and forth. And Paula Felder really documented it well in her book. And she said uh, one of the, the kids was writing to another kid. They're all adults now. If you would like to be near our dear departed father, you need to go to brother whatever his name's uh, farm. And there you will find him in an unmarked grave. So we know he's up in like Fauquier or County or up in that region someplace but he's not here. Do we know what role was played by enslaved persons in this period of our history? Do we know, for example, whether any of the three buildings on the current site were constructed by enslaved persons? Can you comment? Uh, again, we don't have a record. I have not found, there may be a record, but I've never seen a record that tells who had a hand in it in any of the three yeah and i've never never actually found any books that go into construction processes of buildings especially public buildings what the makeup was of the crews 
in Virginia. There may be a book published on that, or we can turn it over to Milana. Maybe she'll have the answer for us, but I sure, I don't have an answer. Um, Milana, did you want to comment on Mary Washington's funeral? Oh, um, I did read something in the paper um, that she was, she had a funeral at St. George's. And I just remember she was buried um, in a different place where her, yeah. Um, yeah. Down, what street is that right Washington, over there? Washington, Washington Street, yeah. yeah. But she had a funeral at St. George's. That yeah. I, Right, and yeah. that made the newspaper. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Reverend Thornton was the uh, rector at that time. Many people have searched for her grave, but like so many others of that time, um, the speculation is that she was buried um, somewhere near where the Mary Washington uh, Monument is today, but the grave has never been located. And uh, speculation says that uh, when the soldiers the, during the Civil War, when the Union soldiers were buried there and later moved, her remains could also have been moved at that time. Um, but no one has been able to locate the exact location of her grave. But the newspaper story did say that her body was carried up the hill from St. George's Church after the funeral. So that's the only clue we have. Was George Washington educated at St. George's? I know that unlike his older brother, he was not sent to England for education. Who would like to comment on that? Well, I, I, I said originally that we would like to think that Reverend uh, Marie taught him uh, the, the hundred rules of, uh, of a gentleman. Um, but also there is uh, another thing that he may have gone to the hobby school in Stafford County. Uh, we know that he drew, that there is a sketch that he drew that is at Mount Vernon that shows him in a snowball fight at the hobby school. Uh, he drew it himself. So our, our like is that he, he went to our school and uh, the hobby school has a sign over there that says he went there probably from age six to 12. So who knows? And I did read, and I can't remember the source right now, that Reverend Marie, since he was the, the only minister actually living at the Glebe, one of the other families, one of his neighbors at the Glebe uh, was the Beverly family. And one thing we're pretty good in Virginia is doing probate inventories on people that have wills and are fairly wealthy, of which Beverly was. And one of the books he had in his personal library was a French book of the rules of civility. So I think it was Paula Felder um, was talking about this. So the conjecture was they were neighbors. They knew each other. They were both members of the church. Beverly was one of the, the, uh, the vestry members. Uh, he would be talking to the the clerk, because he's his neighbor living at the Glebe, and he may have shared the book with him. And he said, oh, this is a good idea. So we don't know that, but we do know there was a book right there in the house next to uh, Reverend Marie that was the Rules of Civility book that he may have used uh, to teach people and may not have used. So it was that book was very popular in France. Yes. And um, so it, it's highly likely that he brought one or more copies with him when he came. Right, he talked to young himself. people. He, we, we have to go with the evidence and we just don't have any evidence about right. that. But we do know that when his father passed away, he was down in Westmoreland County with his uh, stepbrother. And uh, there was also a book of the rules of civility on the shelves in that house. And so there are many places uh, George Washington could have received an education, uh, maybe more than just one. Um, 
did we did we answer the question about slave labor at the yeah at yeah Yes, and I see here someone has commented Washington School doesn't have to be one or the other. It could have been both. Thank you for that. I think our time is almost up and uh, we may have time for another question or so. Does, do any of the other panelists want to come in? Uh, someone has asked uh, in the chat box, what have you all found surprising uh, as you have been researching all this history? Any? The one thing that I found surprising was how big Spotsylvania County was at the beginning around 1720. That's when I was looking at Quineers, uh, he was saying that they went all the way to Ohio. So that was very surprising. I think we have, um, let's see if we've, oh, um, come to the end of our time. We want to thank you for attending tonight. And um, we have another um, presentation on Sunday morning at the Adult Forum. Uh, and we're going to hear again about Reverend Faulkner's years at um, St. George's. Uh, we had 75 people with us tonight. Thank you all so very much. Thank you. <laughs>